So good afternoon, everybody. Um, we are excited to have you here today. Thank you for all of you joining us online. Uh, my name is Amit. I'm a lecturer at the Master in Cybersecurity program here at UC Berkeley and a doctoral candidate at the law school. And I'm excited to have here with us Ophir Weiss. Uh, Ophir is a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, is a security hardware researcher, uh, and, it also, and he also discovered Foreshadow, and is going to tell us a little bit about Foreshadow today, a vulnerability that is affecting all of the major Intel uh, processors out there. All right, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me over. Uh, the camera is over there. Which way, oh, which way should I look? Uh, OK, that's fine. All right. Uh, so uh, in January this year, we uh, discovered and reported uh, foreshadow. Oh, I see a few people coming in. So maybe, yeah, we can wait like half a minute. Hey, Pat? Yeah, just on time. Uh, so in January this year, uh, we discovered and reported a foreshadow, a major security flaw in Intel's processors. And initially, we, were, uh, we didn't understand the full extent of this vulnerability, so we were kind of surprised when Intel requested an embargo period of seven months, meaning a period of time where you're not allowed, uh, or you were requested not to make the vulnerability public. Uh, and uh, on August 14 this year, about two months ago, uh, the embargo was lifted and the vulnerability became public. And depending on what is, on what is your cup of tea of a technical newspaper, you may have seen articles in Wired, um, BBC, uh, ZDNet, or others. Uh, and if you've recently logged into Ubuntu machines, for example, you may have seen this message of uh, to read more on L1 terminal fault. Look in this Wikipedia page of Ubuntu. And L1 terminal fault is basically foreshadow. Uh, and maybe you had a chance to look at our website, foreshadowattack.com. We have some nice Q&A there and some nice videos uh, explaining what's going on. Uh, and when, he, when we initially started our research, we focused on Intel's secure execution technology called uh, SGX. And the purpose of this technology is to protect our data when it's in the cloud. So did any of you guys uh, got a chance to watch the testimony in Congress of Mark Zuckerberg? No? Well, yeah, some of you did. And there was a congressman asking him, uh, hey, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, can you uh, watch my private photos? And then he said, hey, you know, it's, it's on our servers. Of, yeah, I can, I can watch your photos. And that's basically the case uh, in public cloud. If you put your stuff on Amazon Cloud, Microsoft, or Google, basically, of course, the CEO of the company can watch your data. And if there's a rogue employee in this company, can also watch your data. And this is exactly the premise of Intel's secure execution technology, to be able to put your stuff in the public cloud and not even the CEO of this company will be able to look at your data, meaning you can put very sensitive and private information even in the public cloud. And we get some really nice security guarantees by this technology called SGX. We get confidentiality for our data when it's in the memory. We get long-term secure storage. And we also get this uh, remote attestation thing, which is a proof of integrity. You can prove, prove to an external entity that you're executing a specific code, and nobody can manipulate the code that you're executing on someone else's machine. And Foreshadow is capable of basically defeating all these uh, free security guarantees. And we were happy. We wrote the paper. We thought that uh, we only affected this secure execution technology. And further research performed by Intel revealed that actually the same technique used to break the Intel SGX technology also allows uh, breaking a few other technologies. There were three other variants of the Foreshadow attack. And the most interesting one is a variant that allows one virtual machine uh, to read data belonging to another virtual machine. And this is quite, quite devastating, because it means one client in Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud can read data belonging to another virtual machine to another of another client. Uh, so we'll get into this in more detail, and we'll see how it works. And uh, for seven months, uh, the major cloud providers were working on mitigating this attack to make sure uh, that they maintain the privacy of each of their clients. Uh, so foreshadow is a side channel attack. So let's put side channel attacks or cache side channel attacks in perspective. The classical attacks were very algorithm specific. Uh, you had to tailor uh, your attack on the specific implementation of AES encryption, for example, or for the specific implementation of RSA. Uh, and if you had a new implementation, you had to uh, write a new exploit uh, to abuse side channels. And uh, later this year, we heard about uh, Spectre and Meltdown. And Spectre is still application specific. You have to have specific gadgets in your program uh, in order to exploit them and reveal some information. But uh, unlike Spectre, Meltdown is not application specific. You are capable of just extracting data from the operating system, and it doesn't matter uh, what, uh, what is the victim code that is running. And Foreshadow is the next step in this evolution, because Meltdown only allows you to read data if it's in your own virtual address space, in your own operating system. And Foreshadow allows one virtual machine 
read data belonging to another virtual machine. So even if the victim data is outside of the virtual address space, you can still read it. So this is the plan for the day. We're gonna give some background about uh, cache side channel attacks, and then we're gonna talk about speculative execution. Speculative execution is this new technique discovered by Spectre and Meltdown bags uh, to, explore, uh, to exploit microarchitectural behavior of processors. And then we're gonna do a crash course in Meltdown and understand how Meltdown works. And then we'll talk about SGX. And finally, we'll get to the meat of this talk. Uh, so let's uh, first talk about side channel attacks. So the general premise of side channel attacks is that we abuse non-standard output channels. So in the example of this picture, the designer of this safe didn't think that the sound output channel can reveal information about the combination required to open the lock. Uh, and Meltdown is a cache side channel attack. And uh, typically, you need to read a lot of uh, material and understand how processors work. But just in case you haven't had a chance to look at the reading material before this talk, we're going to do some warm up about uh, how caches work. So OK, we have our processor up there, right? And we have the uh, system main memory. And main memory is very slow compared to the speed of processors. It can take uh, three to 400 cycles to bring data from the memory into the processor. And that's why modern processors have this thing called the cache hierarchy, which are basically things sitting uh, inside the CPU die. And uh, if you access to data quite frequently, you bring this data into the cache. And now when you want to access memory, you actually access it in the cache and not from memory. And bringing stuff from uh, the smallest and most fastest cache can take four cycles, unlike the regular memory, uh, which means if uh, data residing in L1 cache, it takes four cycles to bring it. If data resides in main memory, it can take 300 or 400 cycles to bring it into the processor. So does this uh, make sense? Any questions about caches, how they work, timing? All right. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, uh, classical uh, cache side channel attacks that were in the past uh, prior to the era of Meltdown and Spectre. So typically, cache is split into something called cache lines. So we have our attacker and our victim, and the attacker wants to learn some information about what the victim is doing. So the first thing the attacker does, it allocates uh, large buffers of memory and occupies all the lines in cache. And now the attacker lets the victim run. And this can happen by uh, calling a specific API, asking, for example, uh, the victim to encrypt something or sign something. And uh, now the victim accesses the memory, and basically it evicts uh, a piece of memory from the cache in order to run its own uh, software. And the example of uh, AES encryption, typically the AES encryption algorithm accesses a big table, and the specific location that the victim accesses depends on the secret key byte used for encryption. And now the attacker wants to learn something about what uh, the victim has performed. So now the attacker tries to access its own data in the cache. And when it tries to access it, uh, most reads will be fast because the attacker already brought this memory it is into cache. And when it will try to read the cache line that the victim has accessed, the read will be quite slow. And now the attacker can learn something about uh, which memory did the victim access. Does that make sense? All right. So those attacks are very specific to the algorithm we're attacking. It really depends on this table that uh, the victim accesses. If the table changes, we need to devise a new exploit code to attack the new implementation of the encryption. All right. So now it's time to talk about speculative execution. So uh, if you got a chance to watch our uh, video in foreshadowattack.com, you may have seen this image, which tries to explain speculative execution as the processor trying to guess what it needs to execute. So now we'll try to explain it in a bit more technical details. So what we have here uh, on the left is an, a very simple example of uh, computer code. And we are used to thinking about computer code as executing one after the other. We first execute the first instruction, then the second, and so on. And we only execute the second instruction after the first one completed. Um, but this is not how modern processors actually uh, act. What actually happens is that we may want to access a piece of memory. And we said that the main memory is quite slow, so it can take 300 or 400 cycles to access this piece of memory. So what the processor will do now, it will speculatively prefetch the following instructions, and we'll try to look for an uh, independent instruction it can execute while it is waiting for the first piece of memory to arrive. So in this example, if we look at the bottom two instructions, they are independent from the data we are trying to fetch from memory, so the processor will execute them speculatively. Uh, and, uh, but those instructions, while they're executed speculatively, they're not observable uh, to anyone outside the CPU or any, to any other threads. 
only after the piece of data will actually be fetched from memory, only then the instructions will be, uh, it's called retired in uh, architecture terms. And only when instruction is retired, only then it's observable to other components in the system. So uh, let's do another experiment. Let's say that the data we've read before uh, was zero, and that means that if we look at the uh, third instruction here, it means that we're going to do a division by zero, right? We said the data is going to be, user input is zero, we put it in a variable, and then we're going to divide by it which means that uh, this instruction can never retire because, of course, it's an arithmetic mistake. But the processor doesn't know that there's going to be a mistake in this division operation. The processor is still waiting for uh, the user input to arrive from memory. So in the meantime, the processor is going to prefetch the following instructions and execute them. And only after the user input will arrive from memory, only then the processor will realize uh, that uh, actually the data is zero, it cannot divide, and we have to go to the exception handle which means that the following instruction after that were not supposed to be executed. So now the processor uh, will squash the following instructions and make sure that nobody can observe the output of those instructions that were squashed. However, those instructions that were just squashed may leave footprints uh, in, in the cache. And we'll talk in the next uh, few slides what does it mean to leave footprints in the cache. But are there any questions about what does speculative execution mean? Or to guess what the processor needs to execute? All right. So, okay, it's time to talk about the um, famous uh, meltdown attack and understand how it works. So, uh, in meltdown attack, a user space application can read data belonging to the kernel. So, why do we care that a user space application can read data belonging to the kernel? So, the kernel contains data belonging to all the applications running in the system. So, for example, if we have a malicious application, if it can read kernel data, it can read the keystrokes being uh, typed in by the user in its keyboard or if uh, other applications have uh, some passwords belonging to the user, it means that the malicious user space application can read those passwords from the other applications. So let's see how a meltdown exploit look like. Uh, so the first thing the attacker does is allocate some buffer of data called the probing array, and we are trying to guess a secret byte, and a secret byte can have value between zero and 255. So that's why the probing array is of size 256, Time, uh, time something that will help us access different lines of cache, and we'll see soon what do I mean by that. So you allocate the buffer, and the first thing you do is that you uh, make sure this buffer is not in cache. There's an instruction for that. You can tell the processor, please remove this entire array outside of the cache. The next thing the attacker is going to do is to try to access a kernel address, which of course is not allowed to access. Potentially this kernel address uh, contains some other user password or some keystrokes uh, that the user have entered. And what the processor will do is that it will speculatively fetch this byte, even though it's illegal for the user application to access this byte. And then it will speculatively perform the following instruction that will access the probing array. And accessing the probing array will actually bring a piece of data into the cache. Uh, and later on, the processor will realize that reading stuff from kernel was illegal. Uh, this instruction will never retire. There will be a fault handler and the following instruction will be squashed, but the damage or the footprints that the second instruction uh, made to cache, uh, the footprints will still be there in cache. So what can an attacker do now in order to try and reveal what was the secret byte uh, in the kernel address? The attacker will now try to access its own array uh, and will measure the timing of accessing this data. So in, the, uh, in most cases, when the attacker will try to access its own array, the reading will be quite slow, but then it will access the piece of data which are relevant to the secret byte that was read, the access will be fast. So let's try to see it again. Most reads will be quite slow, but the specific uh, uh, location in the array, which depends uh, on the real value of the secret, will be quite fast. And now the attacker can uh, realize the secret byte was actually four in this example. All right, so what happened here? So uh, it all, so to understand what happened in meltdown attack, we need to understand a uh, virtual address space. So uh, the operating system gives an illusion for every application as if it's the only application on the system. So we may have 200, 300, or 1,000 applications running on a machine, but every application thinks it's the only one running on the machine, and the way this is implemented is by having this thing called virtual address space. And in this virtual address space, it's only the operating system and the single application. And kernel uh, space and user space are mapped to the same virtual space. So, uh, but we don't have virtual memory, we, need, we have real memory, right? So uh, the memory is divided into small chunks called pages, and um, then we, we have a mapping from the virtual address space to the physical space. So how does this look like? We have something called the page table, 
and when we have the virtual address that we're trying to access, the virtual page number is used as input into this page table. And as the output, we get something called the page table entry. So what does the page table entry has? It has a few fields. The most interesting of them right now is the physical frame number. Physical frame numbers say this virtual address resides in a specific location in the physical memory. And other than that, we have a few more uh, permission bits. So for example, we have a bit saying, uh, can we write to this uh, memory? And we have another bit saying, does this page belong to the kernel or does this, does this page belong uh, to the application? And if this uh, page, this chunk of memory belongs to the kernel, it means that uh, regular application are, applications are not allowed to access this piece of memory. So what's happening in the example we have of Meltdown? So as like we said before, we allocate the array and we uh, flush it from cache, and then we try to access the kernel address. So even, so if we look at the page table, the processor realizes that it's not allowed to access this piece of memory because this piece of memory belongs to the operating system, but the processor will speculatively bring the data uh, into the relevant register, and the following instruction will speculatively uh, touch the probing array in a location dependent on the secret. And later on, the processor will realize it will make a mistake and will squash the instructions that should never have been executed, but the damage in the cache was already made. There are already footprints that the attacker can uh, look at. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, so what is the mitigation to meltdown? So the problem we had here is that basically we had the operating system and the regular application mapped to the same virtual address space. So the mitigation to meltdown is called kernel page table isolation, or in initials KPTI, and basically the idea, you know what, let's not have a mapping of the kernel space when we're running on our applications. So whenever an application is running, it is actually impossible to uh, even try and address uh, a piece of memory that belongs to the kernel. So if we look at the page table, what uh, happens is that uh, you try to, uh, to translate a virtual address into a physical address that belongs to the kernel, and the result of the page table is that the translation does not exist. It's impossible to access this address. So it seems like everything is fine. After meltdown and after the, this mitigation, it seems that uh, operating systems are secure again, and it's all good. Uh, so now it's time for us to talk about Intel's secure execution technology and why, is it, why it's not vulnerable to the meltdown bug. So SGX purpose, like we said before, is to uh, run an authenticated code in a potentially malicious env environment. We can put the, run our code in some cloud like Google Cloud, Amazon, or Microsoft Cloud, and like we said, no one can actually access our data even though the machine is owned by someone else. So how is, uh, how does it look like? So if we look at all the software layers that we have, we have the operating system, which we don't trust because it's controlled potentially by the cloud provider. We have the hypervisor called also the VMM, which we don't trust. And we have also the hardware, uh, the memory and the motherboard and other components of the hardware that we don't trust. But if we trust Intel's processor, it means that in user space, we can create a secure context called secure enclave. And none of these uh, untrusted software layers or untrusted hardware can access what's going on inside this secure context. And SGX also gives us this nice feature of uh, proving to a remote entity what specific code is running inside a secure uh, enclave. So for example, something running on the cloud can prove to a client that it is trusted and therefore the client can deliver DNA information, pri uh, private medical information, or any other sensitive information that you want to store uh, on the cloud. So how is this implemented? So let's look at the physical memory. So in the physical memory, there's a small uh, section which is sanctioned to be uh, the enclave page cache. And this memory is encrypted by a piece of hardware called the memory encryption engine, which is on the CPU die. And whenever this memory is being brought from the regular memory into the processor, it's being uh, decrypted. And whenever we want to move uh, data from the processor back into memory, it's being encrypted. So what's gonna happen if we try to perform the meltdown attack on the, uh, SGX memory? So what will happen is something called abort page semantics. And that basically means that all writes to this address will be ignored, and all reads uh, from this address will return a constant value of hex FF. Uh, basically, you can think of it as always returning minus one. So let's look at the meltdown code trying to be applied on SGX, and let's see why it doesn't work. So like before, the attacker needs to allocate a buffer and flush it from cache, and the next step is to access an enclave address and see what's going on. So actually, if we access an enclave address, this access is actually perfectly legal. It doesn't uh, raise a fault. You get a bogus value of uh, hex FF. And when we 
the processor speculatively executes the next instruction, the instruction is also legal. We, we touch the probing array in, a specific, in the same constant location, and those instructions can retire, but there's nothing special that we learn. We didn't learn any new information about what's inside this secure context or secure enclave. So let's see how it looks like in practice. So this is now, uh, in this video, we're gonna launch a secure enclave, and then we will try to just uh, read this data and see what's going on. And uh, if we try to read the data inside a secure enclave, basically what we get is constant values. There's nothing interesting to see here. And this is, of course, the first half of our demonstration. Uh, I can tell you that in the other half, we, can see, we will see some more interesting value than just those constant values. All right. So now it's time to talk about uh, foreshadow and how it can uh, defeat all the security guarantees by uh, Intel SGX. All right. So foreshadow has two variants. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the first one, which is an invalid uh, page table entry. There's another variant uh, which we can read about in the paper or ask me later if you'd like. Uh, so let's see what does a terminal fault mean. So Intel calls this vulnerability L1 terminal fault. So uh, like we've seen before, when we try to translate a virtual address into physical address, uh, we take the virtual page number, we use it as an input for the page table, and what we get in response is the page table entry, which tells us where in physical memory uh, this page resides, and then we have a few permission bits, and foreshadow specifically attacks the present bit. So what is the present bit? So let's say that in our laptop we have four gigabytes of memory, but we're running Firefox, and Firefox needs 16 gigabytes of memory. So what's going to happen is something called paging. The operating system will realize it needs more than four gigabytes of memory, so it's gonna take some of the data inside the, the RAM, the memory, and move it into disk. And then the operating system is gonna place in this present bit, it's gonna set the value to zero. So whenever the application of Firefox, for example, will access this piece of memory, there's going to be a page fault. And then the operating system will know, okay, I need to bring this data from disk back into memory. So whenever uh, there's a translation from virtual address to physical address and the present bit is zero, this is called a translation fault because there's no translation from virtual to physical. So what happens when we have a translation fault? So what happens is that whatever we have in the page table entry in the PTE as the physical frame number is going to be immediately delivered into the L1 cache. And if the data is inside the L1 cache, the data is going to be speculatively forwarded for the following instructions. Uh, to execute. And if you look at Intel report about foreshadow, uh, when you have a translation fault, there are three things that uh, do not happen. One of them is that the security checks of uh, SGX, the secure execution technology, the security checks are not applied. Uh, the next one is that security checks that have to do with uh, managing virtual machines are, are not performed. And lastly, there's another technology called system management mode, uh, and security checks that has to do with this technology are also not applied. Basically, if the translation faults, if there's no translation from virtual memory to physical memory, none of the security checks are being performed by the processor. So let's see how a basic uh, attack code of foreshadow looks like. So uh, now we assume that uh, the operating system is malicious, and uh, there are scenarios where you don't have to have the operating system to be malicious, but uh, this is for the sake of simplicity of this discussion. So the first thing that the attacker does, it needs to uh, poison the page table entry to make sure that the present bit is zero. And then the rest of the code is basically the same thing like the meltdown attack. So the, first, the next thing we do is we uh, allocate a buffer, we flush it from cache, and then we try to access an enclave address, an address that resides inside this secure uh, context. So let's see what happens underneath the hood when you're trying to access this enclave address. So the first thing that happens inside the processor is that we need to walk the page table to get the translation virtual to physical, to get this uh, page frame number. Uh, and the next thing that happens is that the processor verifies that the translation is legal. And the translation is not legal, and therefore no security check is going to be performed. But, however, this data will be fetched and then delivered into the next instruction. So this uh, physical frame number is going to be forwarded to uh, the L1 cache, and if the data is there, the data will be then forwarded uh, to the relevant register in the processor, and then the next instruction can be uh, speculatively performed, which will leave a footprint in the cache. And at that point, the game is over. The attacker can already learn what was the secret value inside the address. So those instructions obviously are illegal. It's illegal uh, to access uh, an invalid translation, and they will never retire. Uh, but uh, the damage is already done. So, uh, so far we've seen how an attacker can read data if it's inside the L1 cache. 
So this is quite limited, right? The L1 cache in most processors today is about 32 kilobytes, and uh, enclaves can be potentially gigabytes of data. Um, so what would happen if an attacker could actually bring data from main memory to L1 cache? And the way it would look is the first step would be to bring data from the main memory into L1 cache, and the next step would be to bring it from L1 cache into the processor in the attack we've just seen. And this is actually possible in SGX, because if we look at how a physical memory look like, so encrypted memory in SGX is only about 93 megabytes, and this is quite small, right? We want to have uh, user applications of sizes of gigabytes of data. So the way this is allowed is by having special instructions that allow uh, moving uh, pages from the encrypted memory into regular memory in a secure way, and when we want to bring the data from, that we removed from encrypted memory to main memory, when we want to bring it back into the enclave page cache, uh, the operating system can do it. And when we bring this page back into the encrypted, uh, the enclave page cache, the entire page is actually brought into the L1 cache. Uh, and this has uh, a very devastating repercussions because it means that now the victim code doesn't need to run. If I want to steal one gigabyte of data from an enclave, I don't need the, I don't need the victim to run. I can just bring all its pages into L1 cache and then use the attack we've just seen in order to dump its data, which means uh, no mitigation inside the victim code can be applied. If we look at the Spectre attacks, there are some mitigations talking about we need to modify our code to be more secure, but if the victim code that is vulnerable doesn't need, even need to run, it means that no mitigation in the victim code can actually help us. So now uh, let's look at the demonstration. That's what we've seen before, and we've seen that if we just try to read this memory, we get constant values. So now if we try to apply our attack and read the uh, enclave code, uh, we actually are able byte after byte to read the actual values. And we put some uh, text inside the secure enclave, but this, those enclaves in Lenovo computers, for example, protect uh, fingerprinting data, or those uh, enclaves supposed to protect very sensitive uh, data in the cloud environment. As you can see, basically, we can just dump the entire data inside enclaves out, and the success rate is very close to 100%. And uh, you can just dump entire enclaves at any given time in the life cycle of the enclave. So what are the uh, ramifications for uh, SGX enclaves? So basically, we, confidentiality is gone because we can just read entire enclave contents, right? What's going on? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, w it means that also long-term secure storage is gone because the way secure storage works is that the uh, secure enclave requests the processor, please give me an encryption key, and then it needs to encrypt the data and store it on disk. But because we can steal data from the enclave at any given time, it means um, we can also stop the enclave immediately after it requested the encryption key. We can steal the encryption key and then read whatever it is in the secure storage. And it means we can also, for example, re-encrypt whatever data that we want in this secure storage. And it also means that the proof of integrity is gone because we also attacked Intel Arch architectural enclaves, and those are enclaves written by Intel, and they run on every machine that has SGX, and those enclaves protect uh, real secrets provided by Intel used to uh, uh, provide proof of integrity. So let's dig a little bit more into this proof of integrity and understand how it's broken. And let's also understand how come that because we can break a single machine, we actually uh, can destroy the trust in the entire ecosystem uh, of SGX. All right. So uh, to understand that, let's start with a security key, a security quiz. So let's say that I bought a machine that supports Intel Secure Execution Technology, SGX, and I'm hacking it in my own home in the basement, okay? And it has no user data. It has no private data belonging to any user. However, because it's an SGX machine, it actually contains, uh, it actually contains private keys provided by Intel called EPID private keys. And we'll talk about those keys in a second. And those keys are supposed to be heavily guarded by the enclave uh, created by Intel. It's called an architectural quote enclave. But as we've seen, we can actually uh, read the entire contents of this enclave, which means we can also steal this key. So why is this important that we can steal this key, and why do I say that we actually can compromise the entire ecosystem by stealing one key from one machine? All right, so let's understand, let's try to talk about what is remote attestation in the context of uh, secure execution. So we have our cloud server, and we have a client that is communicating with the cloud server, and the client doesn't trust the cloud server yet. So in order for the client to trust the cloud server, the server needs to generate a proof called a quote. And this proof is signed with uh, the private key that resides uh, on this, this machine. So the cloud server sends this proof into the client, 
and the client cannot verify this proof by itself. It has to com communicate with Intel attestation server, and only after Intel approves that the proof is correct, only then the, the client knows it can trust the cloud server. And the rest of the communication will be secured uh, by the uh, shared secret that they have just established. But the takeaway here is that the entire trust of this uh, protocol uh, assumes that the EPID key is trusted. But still, it's not yet clear how come that stealing one EPID key actually compromised the entire ecosystem of SGX. So to understand that, we need to talk a little bit more about the EPID signature scheme. So EPID signature scheme come with uh, a great property of privacy preserving, meaning that once uh, a machine generates a proof or a quote, it's impossible to distinguish it from other machines. So if we look at uh, many quotes, if we look at a million quotes, it's impossible to know if those million quotes were all signed by a single EPID key or they were signed by five million machines using five million different keys. And this means that uh, there are severe consequences because it means that an attacker can steal one EPID key and then it can compromise potentially five million machines or five million sessions. I have one key and I can perform a man in the middle attack in five million sessions and I can sign five million quotes and by looking at the communication, it's impossible to know that those five million sessions were actually compromised and they were all signed by a single key. Uh, and that means that the attacker can actually hide inside this privacy preserving protocol. And we had some fun with this uh, in a Twitter bot uh, that we created. And because we uh, were able to extract a real private EPID key, um, you could go to the uh, Twitter bot at the time and request attestation for whatever you wanted. And the Twitter bot would reply with a valid quote. And this quote was, actually valid, you can go to Intel attestation server and Intel would reply with, yes, this quote is valid, it, it's correct. And of course, those keys uh, were later on revoked uh, by Intel. Um, all right, so uh, what are the mitigations for SGX? So the first thing that Intel did is they added an instruction to flush the L1 cache. Uh, and whenever uh, there is an SGX specific instruction, L1 cache is flushed. So when we page things in and out, uh, from the enclave page cache, the L1 cache is flushed. So our trick of bringing stuff from main memory to cache is no longer possible. The next mitigation is basically Intel, instru Intel instructed that if you want SGX to be secure, you must turn off hyperthreading. Uh, but this is kind of like a strong requirement because SGX is also intended to run on our laptops and it's not quite reasonable to ask end, end users to turn off hyperthreading. So for example, if you bought an i7 uh, core machine, you may think that you have eight cores, but actually what you have is four physical cores and each one has two logical cores Meaning, if you turn off hyperthreading, you basically lose half of your cores in your machine, and you lose a lot of performance. And because Intel know, knows it's not reasonable to ask everyone to turn off hyperthreading, Intel also provides two sets of keys for every machine. One set of keys is actually not trusted in the case you decided not to turn off hyperthreading, and the other set of keys is to be used in trusted machines when you, the user actually decided to turn off hyperthreading. All right. Uh, so now it's time to talk about foreshadow next gen and how come it's possible for a virtual machine to read data belonging to another virtual machine. All right, so remember we've seen this uh, image of virtual memory, user space and kernel space, and we said that this is mapped uh, to physical memory. But when we look at virtualization, this mapping is not actually from virtual memory to physical memory, it's actually from virtual memory to guest physical memory. And there's another layer of mapping from guest physical memory into a host physical memory. So guest physical memory is not really physical, it's actually also virtual. And then we have a mapping from guest physical to host physical. So how does it look like if we look at the page table? So we said we have our virtual address and the virtual page number is used as an input to the page table and then we get the page, uh, the page table entry. And in the page table entry, we have the uh, guest physical frame number. And this is not the end of the story. Then we have another page table basically called the extended page table, the EPT, which is used to translate the guest uh, frame number into a, a real physical address, the host physical number. But remember that if we're talking about virtual machines, uh, this mapping of virtual to guest physical is actually under the control of the untrusted virtual machine. And that means that the untrusted operating system in this malicious virtual machine can actually poison the PTE, the page table entry, and uh, zero the specific bit in the, in the PTE and it can put in the guest fr physical frame number whatever it wants. So it can decide that it wants to read specific address, address 1000, and then put uh, present bit zero. And let's see what happens then. So basically, when we put uh, present bit, we set the present bit to be zero, the next translation of guest physical to host physical is not performed. 
and that means that guest physical address is treated as host physical address. Basically, it means that the untrusted virtual machine can read any physical memory it wants to read from the host, and if it can read any physical memory in the host, it means it can also read memory belonging to other virtual machines. All right, so let's uh, illustrate how, what happens. So we said that we set the present bit to zero, and then the guest physical frame number is actually used as input to the L1 cache, and if the data is there, it's gonna be speculatively forwarded for the following instructions, and that way the attacker can actually get data belonging to another virtual machine. All right, so what happened is basically, is if we had two virtual machines, we had a virtual, vi victim virtual machine and an attacker vi uh, virtual machine, the attacker uh, VM can actually read any data of the victim so long as it's inside the L1 cache. Uh, so what are the limitations of this attack? It means that we can only read data if it's inside the L1 cache, and unlike SGX, it's not entirely clear how can an attacker uh, make sure the data is in L1 cache. One option, for example, if it's a public service, maybe we can call some specific API, and that API will bring data into cache. Uh, but there's a saying, I think uh, Bruce Schneier was the one who coined it, that attacks never get worse, they only get better. So today this is a limitation, and tomorrow a smart hacker can realize how it's possible to bring data into cache. And then the other limitation that we have is that the attacker needs to have some guess on what is the physical address it's actually trying to read. And that's actually not uh, trivial. Uh, and so far, there, there's no known attacks in the wild of how this is possible uh, to guess the physical address and bring data into L1 cache. It's very specific for the application that uh, an attacker is potentially interested in attacking. All right, so what is the mitigation for, for Shadow Next Gen? So it's not really practical to ask the cloud providers to disable uh, hyperthreading because this will be more than 30% performance degradation, and no serious cloud provider will be willing to take 30% uh, loss of money. So basically, the recommendation is that, okay, in every physical core in the machine, typically we have two logical cores. So until foreshadow, basically, those logical cores were treated as independent cores, and those days are over. Now, basically, uh, the uh, cloud provider needs to make sure that on every sibling cores on the same physical core, it has to be the same virtual machine that is running. And depending on uh, what is the usages of cores of your clients, it might actually cause you to lose a lot of performance, uh, because if you have a client that only needs three cores, for example, so you can put two cores on the same physical core, and the other one will actually be alone, and you cannot core reside another client in, uh, in this processor. Uh, the other mitigation is basically whenever you are switching to another machine, you need to scrub the L1 cache to make sure there are no secrets belonging to the previous uh, virtual machine. Uh, and lastly, what you need to do is basically make sure that uh, whenever you are exiting in a virtual machine, for example, you may have an interrupt you need to service. Uh, so if you are exiting to the hypervisor, you need to make sure um, that uh, the hypervisor is not touching any secret and secrets and that there's no attacker virtual machine that's trying to steal information from the L1 cache. All right, so to conclude uh, what we had today, so basically uh, Intel SGX, at least if it's running on an unpatched machine with hyper-threading on, is completely insecure. All the free security guarantees by this technology uh, are broken until the machines are patched. Uh, and we also seen that privacy preserving properties like the EPID signature scheme can backfire because attackers can also hide in these privacy uh, preserving uh, conditions. And lastly, we've seen that the virtualization boundary is severely cracked, so maybe there are no attacks in the wild, but still the fact that it's possible for uh, one virtual machine to read data of another virtual machine is uh, quite devastating. And for more information, you are welcome to go to our website to see some Q&A and some of our uh, movies. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions if you have. I'll start with one technical. I'm Pat, I'm over on the CS side of the world. So I'll start with one technical one and then maybe some higher level questions after that. Uh, the mitigations to the foreshadow NG stuff, mm -hmm. those are all things that the host provider has to do, right? Yep. So there's nothing a client can do to mitigate against those right now? Uh, the client has nothing, the client can only ask the cloud provider, hey, do you have mitigations for foreshadow next gen? That's the only thing that the client can do right now. And since it's only ever defending against a malicious cloud provider in the first place, Oh, we're talking about, wait, there's foreshadow SGX and next gen. Yeah. So basically in SGX, uh, you need to rely on the attestation mechanism. Uh, Intel advanced their security version number, uh, and, and now uh, basically if you try to run a 
a piece of software which is not, or a machine which is not mitigated, uh, and then you'll go and ask Intel, hey, is this proof of uh, integrity is correct? Uh, Intel will respond with no, this is uh, not, this is an untrusted platform. Uh, go ahead. I just want to pop way up the stack now uh, okay. to the pragmatic side of the world. So you opened with this uh, like cute example of Facebook and whatever yeah. else, but Facebook's not using SGX to yeah. hide our photos from Mark Zuckerberg right at yeah, this yeah. moment. Uh, so where is this break affecting me, Joe, user okay. right now? So uh, SGX became public in 2015. Uh, since 2015, you can buy processors that support SGX. Uh, right now, there are several startups um, planning on, on creating products based on SGX, and when those products will be used in the wild, uh, customers should be really careful that their machines are, are patched and not vulnerable, because if you have, for example, some cryptocurrency wallet protected by SGX on your laptop, you probably want to make sure that your private keys of your cryptocurrencies are secure. So today, potentially, uh, most users don't care. I believe there's a Lenovo laptop that stores the fingerprinting information inside SGX. So those users uh, might want to uh, see what's going on on their machine. Um, and I think no cloud, I think uh, cloud providers potentially have pilots on SGX, but I don't think there's a product used by uh, many users today using SGX. Okay, so this is not, this is not a heart bleed, this is a... So, so basically the foreshadow next uh, NG uh, is actually relevant to all of us using cloud services because maybe there are some attacks in the wild that we don't know about, right? And if uh, someone can run on some cloud provider and read data belonging from some other client, then maybe we should care. So potentially you wanna ask your cloud provider, well I guess clients, if you're using 23 on me or any other cloud service, and actually we all use many services that are running on the cloud and we don't even know about it. So most clients have nothing to do because we don't even know if it's running, on which cloud is it running? Uh, do you know if it's running on Google Cloud, Amazon or Microsoft? Uh, so the providers of those services should talk with their cloud provider and say, hey, are you, uh, do you have patches applied for, for Shadow Next Gen? Keep asking. Uh, I'll quit soon. Uh, the other one, you know, the whole argument here was that clients, you want to trust that your cloud people have patched. Is there any way for clients to validate that the cloud is patched? Um, so... Clients, you mean the clients that are writing the services running in the cloud? Yeah, so I, I as a service, okay. can I validate that this SGX has been patched and is secure? So um, you need to ask your cloud provider what is the version of the KVM or the hypervisor that's running. So it's so, a trust thing at that point? At this point, it's a trust thing. Uh, obviously, if you're running in one of the major ones, they have patches applied. If you're running on one of the smaller ones, um, they are, not run, they are not writing their own hypervisor software, right? So you, basically you have to ask them, and uh, we have a lawyer here in the audience, and I'm assuming they will not lie to you explicitly uh, if they have patches or not. Uh, and there's also a variant of the attack, by the way, that applies uh, to having a user space application stealing data from the kernel. So that is something you can check by yourself. There's a specific a way to uh, pull the operating system and ask what patches does it have to make sure that the variant that has to do with a user reading kernel space um, is not applicable, that there are patches installed in the operating system. So can you tell us how you go about finding a vulnerability like this and then you specifically mm -hmm. how you, your involvement okay. in that? Um, so finding vulnerability, so I guess for every researcher it's different and for me, most of my research was trying to build secure systems. And I know that for me, I heard about Spectre and Meltdown uh, with everyone else this January this year. And my first thought was that uh, Meltdown is not applicable to SGX. And then I started thinking in my head, uh, okay, wait a second. I think if you do some specific uh, tricks and shticks, potentially you can actually read data from the secure execution. And then I contacted uh, some colleagues I roughly knew and, and suggested that, you know, I think uh, we should try those techniques. Uh, and then we started working on this, and basically I think we started in the beginning of January, and about two and a half weeks later we had a working exploit, and we informed Intel uh, that we were able to break the technology. Um, so that was uh, my path of finding this vulnerability. I assume that other researchers potentially have different anecdotes on how they come about on finding vulnerabilities. And what was the, uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about um, Intel's response and the patches that have, been, mm -hmm. that have been applied or created. How would you assess their responsiveness? 
Uh, so I know that Intel is working really hard to try and respond to vulnerabilities from Meltdown, Spectre, and other ones. And uh, I think they've been quite responsible in trying to coordinate with uh, the big players um, and make sure they are informed. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the smaller players in the, in the cloud or some of the smaller players of SGX potentially might have complaints because some of them have only heard about this vulnerability only when it became public. Um, and some of them would probably want to get notification not together with the rest of the world, but potentially a few weeks before. Um, but most of the information I have about which companies heard about the vulnerability when is mostly anecdotal. Potentially there's a place to do some wider research about when do companies hear about vulnerabilities versus when is the manufacturer know about the vulnerability. Um, so major, play major players hear about it quite immediately. Smaller players are later in the game and even smaller players hear about it like everyone else in, in the media. Um, here, another thought is, does um, finding a vulnerability like this mm -hmm. um, lead you to a sense of the, the environment or the way it's set up is, is not well designed? Like you could say that the internet is not well designed for security. Would you say this similarly mm -hmm. about this, this, what you found so, here? So, so actually it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think the design of the technology, both uh, Intel Secure Execution SGX and uh, virtualization is actually designed to be secure. And um, I think any implementation of basically anything in computer science is bound to eventually have bugs. Um, anything designed by humans eventually have some mistakes in it. Uh, and you know, we had 30 years ago buffer overflows, and then uh, we came up with technologies like uh, NX bit, non-execute bit, or ASLR, randomization of address space. And things become more and more secure with the years. Um, the hackers become over the years also most I more interested and more incentivized by money to actually fi find hacks. So that's why we keep seeing vulnerabilities. But I think basically the way to make things more secure is to have more security research, then fix the problems. And maybe I guess the conclusion that if you have a new uh, secure technology, maybe you should give it some time for researchers or uh, white hackers to find vulnerabilities. And after a few years, potentially it's more secure. And eventually security vulnerabilities will be found in everything, but things beca do become more secure with the years. But I think that the, the overall design of these technologies is secure and is good, and we just need the involvement of security community to find these bugs and make those technologies even better. In the meantime, while we wait for our questions from um, the online participants, uh, I want to ask you exactly a follow-up question on this mm -hmm. on this topic, mm -hmm. because this is a unique attack, mm -hmm. right? And our assets are different, are more complex. This is not web application. So I'm wondering if you can expand specifically on how you know we can build a more robust mm -hmm. security posture. Um, and incentivize security research in this specific field mm. of hardware vulnerabilities and speculative executions. Mm. Uh, also taking into account the future of this mm. you know, type of attack, speculative uh, mm. execution attacks. Right. So speculative execution attack is basically a, a very new and exciting avenue for exploits. Potentially it's something similar to buffer overflows that we discovered 30 years ago. And it seems that everyone in their own field are trying to see, oh, we have this speculative execution feature now. What new security vulnerabilities can we find? And there were several uh, variants of the Spectre attack. Um, and there was also a lazy FP and a bunch of other ones. Um, so I think some of the companies are trying to put more and more bounties out there uh, for hardware bugs to incentivize researchers outside to find more bugs. Uh, I think academic researchers potentially have different incentives from industry researchers. Uh, academic researchers are interested in finding new classes of attacks, which are definitely important to find, like these ones. And industry researchers are incentivized to find problems in existing products, even if they're using known techniques. But if we have a new product out there, 
uh, to find the vulnerabilities in the new product. Um, so other than uh, uh, having, being very open, I think any, any uh, provider, any manufacturer like Intel or Google or Microsoft should be open to uh, receive reports about vulnerabilities, which I believe they are. Things can always become better. But I think basically being open or being receptive to uh, reports from, from researchers, industry and academia, uh, and then when the time is right to make them public. Uh, and I think that's the way to make systems more secure. So the, um, the question is, he may have missed this, but does this allow malicious code to be injected into the enclave? So the thing is that you don't need malicious code to be injected into the enclave because you get everything in a sense. So why would you want to inject code into something? Because you want it to behave in a way that the enclave was not supposed to, to execute. So basically, because you can forge the proof of integrity, you don't need to inject code. You basically run an alternative fake enclave and you are able to prove to anyone interested that you are a genuine enclave. So let's say uh, you stole uh, an EPID private key, and then you write some code, and then you prove to a client uh, that you are a genuine SGX enclave. The client trusts you because you gave it a valid proof. It's a forged proof, but it's a valid proof. And then the client will deliver to you his secrets. So you don't need to inject code. You can basically write your own code and prove to a client that a different type of code is running. Uh, and I hope that answers the question. So how do you see um, coordinate disclosure fitting into this? Mm -hmm. Not in terms of, of course, industry should work with the community and they are working with the community, mm -hmm. but in terms of adjusting the timelines and the flexibility, mm -hmm. given that um, right now, the, like the group that is most incentivized to work on these are academics and they have mm -hmm. their publication and you know that's their yeah. core motivation. Um, which is also complex to mitigate with code and disclosure because you mm. need to submit yeah, something yeah. and you have uh, your, your reviewers and the like. Uh, and, and, the f and the flip side, which is this is a very complex code and disclosure mm. um, you know, process where we have supply chain demands, we have issues mm. you know, that we can't solve like patching and the like, and we have um, just a lot of stakeholders involved and the impact is mm. severe. So what kind of a adjustment from a researcher mm -hmm. uh, point of view do you think that we need to to implement here do we need you know a different academic standard for this do we need mm -hmm. what can we do to mitigate the so, concerns so um, we researchers always like to complain that uh, disclosure takes too long uh, and it takes a lot of time to take a response and then sometimes if you hear some details about what's going on you actually realize that uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes sometimes that you don't see and potentially us as researcher we will be happier if the providers will give us more information and explain, hey, look, we are trying to coordinate this with those major players, and we are trying to come up with fixes, and things take time. So if there was potentially a bit more openness about what's happening behind the scenes, I think we as researchers would become more happy with this process. Um, as for changing incentives, it's not clear. Academics want to publish papers, and papers can typically be published uh, only on very novel techniques. Uh, so researchers will not eventually will not perform pen testing because pen testing is typically taking existing techniques and applying them to new uh, products. Um, so I think it's basically different incentives because if you talk about bug bounties, academics, at least for my anecdotal experience, don't care that much about money. Uh, but bigger bounties will not incentivize academics more to do more research. Potentially, if uh, some of the industry will work with academics in some way uh, to help the academics have a better exposure in, in the community, in the academic community, then uh, maybe that's a better incentive for academics to find new things. Um, I guess uh, the incentives need to be adjusted depending on who do you want researching the problems. Do you want industry security researchers to find problems or do you want academics? And those are different types of bugs that you typically get. So incentives for academics potentially we need to think about new incentive mechanisms which are not necessarily money because this for my experience, doesn't necessarily work for uh, academics. Mm 
Okay, so with that, um, I would like to thank Ophir uh, for his time today. This, is, uh, this has been really eye-opening. Thank you so much. Oh, there is one last question. Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so code in the SGX enclave is used, I think, by DRMs mm -hmm. so that the execution of the DRM is protected. Couldn't I use SGX to protect malware in the same way? Short answer, yes. Uh, and Intel actually thought about this, and this is why if you want to run uh, code inside SGX, and there was a bunch also of academic papers about this, uh, you have to um, have a license with Intel. So basically, and this licensing process is quite complicated. It's not just you send an email to Intel and then you check a box. There's a, a validation process for Intel to give you a license, and if you don't have a license, you actually cannot run SGX code. Which, by the way, it's a different problem in SGX, but basically, uh, if you're writing a malware, it's either you steal a key belonging to someone with a license, uh, or you somehow get a license yourself. Um, but that is correct. You can run a malware inside SGX if you are able to get um, a licensing key to run code in SGX. In theory, you can write a malware, and nobody can look uh, inside and see what is the code you're executing. And this is exactly why Intel came up with this licensing mechanism. Uh, and in theory, this uh, licensing key can also be revoked later on. But this is actually a real problem. Okay, and with that, thank you so much, Fear.